Hello, welcome to this presentation. Hi, I'm SOPNs. I want to give a presentation on respiratory physiology. Now, this presentation will help in two ways. Number one is to give you a quick revision of uh, things that you've known in respiratory physiology. Number two is to give you the overview of what you need to know on respiratory physiology. Let's have the highlights of the presentation. Now, number one, we start with introduction. That is talking about the physiologic anatomy of the respiratory tracts. Number two, the pulmonary circulation. Number three, the principles of respiration. Number four, we look at lungs, volumes, and capacities. Number five, we look at the ventilation. Number six, we look at exchange of respiratory gases. Number seven, we look at transport of respiratory gases. Number eight, we look at regulation of respiration. Number nine, we look at respiratory insufficiencies and pathophysiology. Number ten, we look at the effects of exercise on respiration. So I implore you to sit back as we enjoy this presentation. Now, starting with the first one, which is our introduction. Now, respiration in actual sense is the uptake of oxygen and the release of CO2 okay now talking about the types of respiration we have external and internal respiration that is at the level of the lungs external respiration is at the level of the lungs internal respiration is at the level of the body cells all right talking about the phase of respiration we have inspiration and expiration inspiration the air coming in into the lungs Expiration, the air going out of the lungs. All right. So let's quickly talk about the lungs anatomy before we uh, ride on. Now the lungs are paired thoracic organs that are located in the pulmonary cavities. Okay. The two lungs are separated by mediastinum. The lungs are ensheathed by serous membranes, which are pleura and visceral pleura. Between the two pleura. There is a pleural cavity that contains pleural fluid. Sometimes when there is excessive fluid in this pleural cavity, we call it pleural effusion. Let's go talk about that as we proceed. All right. Let's talk about the respiratory membrane. Respiratory membrane uh, forms a blood air barrier. We've heard about different barrier systems. Uh, now this membrane forms air, blood air barrier. Now, it's formed by two membranes, the alveolar and capillary membranes, okay? Now, let's talk about the lung airways, the respiratory tracts. The respiratory tracts consist of the nose, the nasopharynx, the larynx, trachea, the bronchi, you know? That is, uh, we have the, the primary bronchi, the secondary bronchi, the tertiary bronchi, then to the bronchioles, then blah 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 to the terminal bronchioles all right from terminal bronchioles then to the respiratory bronchioles now terminal bronchioles actually end the uh, conductive portion of the respiratory tracts why the respiratory bronchioles uh marks the beginning of the respiratory units please note that the respiratory tracts has two major units the conductive portion and the respiratory portion so the respiratory portion starts from the respiratory bronchioles to the alveolar ducts to the alveolar sacs to the antrum and to the alveoli now each alveolus is lined by two pneumocytes or alveolar cells which are type 1 and type 2 type 1 cells are for gaseous exchange they are simple squamous cells all right that are for gaseous exchange why type 2 uh, cuboidal in nature, uh, cuboidal in shape, and uh, they secrete surfactants, which uh, reduce the surface tension and prevents lungs collapse after expiration. All right. Now let's quickly talk about the non-respiratory functions of the respiratory tracts. There's aside from respiratory function, we have some other non-respiratory function that is performed by these tracts. So let's have. Um, the overview we have olfaction that is smelling we have vocalization that is you know phonation talking you know uh, that is a function of the vocal cords that are present along the respiratory tracts okay that is in the larynx 
We have defensive functions through various immune cells that are located along these tracts and majorly in the lungs too. I talk about the mouse cells, talk about the, um, uh, the macrophages, the abdominal macrophages and some other immune cells. Regulation of acid-base balance. Yes, the lungs is involved in regulation of acid-base balance. Okay. Regulation of water balance. Yes. Regulation of body temperature. Yes. Um, the tract regulate body temperature as well as uh, the lungs too by releasing, you know, water and trying to control the body temperature. Then secretion of angiotensin converting enzyme and other other colloids such as prostaglandins, acetylcholine, serotonin, etc. Okay. Now, uh, we have some respiratory protective reflexes such as uh, cough and sneezing reflexes. Those reflexes are protective in nature by trying to uh, take away the irritants that are inhaled in the air. All right. Now, the second part is pulmonary circulation. Now, when you talk about pulmonary circulation, the normal pulmonary blood flow is about 5 liters per minute. That is the total amount of blood that circulates in the systemic circulation. Okay, that is the blood that gets to the lungs for oxygenation. That is about 5 liters per minute. Arterial supply. The lungs is supplied by two major arteries. The pulmonary artery is poorly oxygenated. The bronchial artery is richly oxygenated. Then the venous drainage. It has two veins too. The pulmonary veins and the bronchial veins. The pulmonary veins are richly oxygenated. The bronchial veins are poorly oxygenated. Note that when we talk about the veins and artery, all arteries are contain richly oxygenated blood except pulmonary artery. Note that. And all veins contain poorly oxygenated blood except pulmonary veins. Alright? Let's talk about an important concept that we call physiological shunts. Physiological shunts is a condition is a bypassing phenomenon in which veins empty into arteries, which results in venous admixture of blood. Okay, uh, we have a number of examples. Physiological shunts take place in the lungs, doesn't take place in the heart. That is the Tabesian veins, the small veins empty into the cardiac chambers. All right, but let's differentiate that from anatomical shunts. Anatomical shunts is when artery is, is anatomical in nature, you know, when artery uh, to arterial, then the arterial to the venue. So, skipping or bypassing the capillaries, alright? So, that is anatomical shunt, as different from physiological shunts. The arterial emptying directly into the venous by bypassing the capillaries, okay? Now, the third part is the principles of respiration. Let's have a look at uh, the principles of how respiration is brought about. Now we start with respiratory muscles. The respiratory muscles, we talk about the muscles of inspiration, we talk about muscles of expiration. Okay? The muscles of inspiration are majorly the diaphragm, which is supplied by phrenic nerve, external intercostal muscles, is supplied by uh, the intercostal nerves. We have the scaly muscles, we have the sternocleidomastoid muscle, we have serratus anterior, we have pectoral muscles, etc. Expiratory muscles. Now, under normal condition, expiration is a passive process, okay, in quiet breathing. But during forceful breathing, muscles are involved in respiratory process. And, and, and those are internal intercostal muscles, the rectus abdominis, and some other abdominal flat muscles okay now talking about compliance compliance is an important ability of the lungs and thorax to expand or stretch okay so it is defined as a measure of change in volume per unit change in pressure so the lung compliance for both lungs is actually 200 mils of air per centimeter of water okay centimeter of water for transpulmonary pressure because we said compliance is the change in volume over change in transpulmonary pressure. Every one centimeter uh, increase in transpulmonary pressure causes increase in ability of the lungs to stretch for 200 mils. That's the meaning, okay, for compliance. Then point number four, that is the lung volumes and capacities. The lung volumes and capacities. Starting with the lung volumes. The lung volumes are the tidal volume, 
Final volume is the volume of air breathing and out of the lungs in a normal quiet breathing. The normal value is 500 mL. Inspiratory reserve volume is the extra or additional volume of air that can be inspired forcefully after normal inspiration. The normal value is 3000 mL. Expiratory reserve volume is the additional volume of air that can be expired forcefully after normal expiration. The normal value is 1100 mL. Residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after forced expiration. The normal value is 1200 mL. So all these values are actually got from Guyton and all physiology textbook. So if you like to check those values, you can find out from them. The lung capacities, we have the inspiratory capacity, which is the maximum volume of air that is inspired after normal expiration. All right. Inspiratory capacity is measured by tidal volume plus inspiratory reserve volume, which uh, which aggregates to be 3,500 mL. Okay. Vital capacity is the maximum volume of air that can be expelled out forcefully after a deep inspiration. That's when I tell you breathe in, breathe out forcefully, breathe in, breathe out as testing your vital capacity. Vital capacity is measured by three volumes uh submission of three volumes inspiratory reserve volume expiratory reserve volume plus tidal volume which aggregates to be 4600 mL. okay functional residual capacity is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after normal expiration the volumes that are involved are the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume which aggregates to be 2300 mL. The total lung capacity is the total volume of air that is present in the lungs after a deep or maximum inspiration. So, total lung capacity measures, you know, is a, is, is a summation of all volumes, which approximates to be 5,800 mL. All right. Now, spirometers, including respirometer and platysmograph, are used to measure lung volumes. And capacities okay then applicational volumes and capacity those are volumes that are they, they have applicational you know use like um all these on um, clinical uh, diagnosis and things like that so we start with the fog's respiratory volume or timed vital capacity this is the volume of air which can be expired forcefully in a given unit of time which is you know usually per seconds after a deep inspiration now let's talk about the significance the significance of this volume or capacity is it has high diagnostic value as it decreases uh it decreases in respiratory or obstructive diseases such as asthma and emphysema okay then let's talk about another uh application of volume that is respiratory minute volume Respiratory minute volume is the volume of air breathed in and out of the lungs every minute. Okay, this volume is calculated by multiplying the tidal volume times the respiratory rate, which is 500 times 12, which gives you 6,000 mL or 6 liters per minute. Okay, the maximum breathing capacity is the maximum volume of air which can be breathed in and out of the lungs by forceful respiration all right then let's go to part five which is on ventilation 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 simply speaking is the continuous movement of air from one place to another a room to be ventilated you know as talking about you know continuous movement of air of fresh air all right so we also have ventilation along the airways so that there can be of uh, uh, coming of fresh air and going out of you know you know of used air all right so we have familiar types of ventilation we have pulmonary ventilation and alveolar ventilation now pulmonary ventilation is a continuous cyclic process by which fresh air moves into the lungs and used air of equal volume leaves the lungs okay also it is the volume of air that is continuously moving in and out of the lungs per minute in quiet breathing okay it's also called respiratory minute volume 
the normal value is 6000 mils per minute okay then the alveolar ventilation is a continuous movement of air in and out of the alveoli that's at the alveolar level now okay it determines the amount of air that is used for gaseous exchange every minute okay the normal value is tidal volume minus dead space times the respiratory rates tidal volume minus dead space volume times the respiratory rate which gives you 4200 mils per minute all right dead space is the portion of the respiratory tract where gaseous exchange does not take place okay it contains the unused air there are two types we have the anatomical and physiological dead space the physiological dead space are those additional spaces where gaseous exchange should take place under normal condition but are not functional due to different reasons you know take for instance when you have air in some inactive alveoli okay so under normal condition anatomical dead space should be equal to physiological dead space unless you have non-functional alveoli so anatomical dead space occur in those conductive portion of the respiratory tracts all right now please relax i'll be back after this short break welcome back so let's uh, go to the um, sixth section that is the exchange of respiratory gases now gaseous exchange occur at the level of the lungs it also occurs at the level of the tissues so we're going to consider exchange of respiratory gases at two levels now starting with the level of the lungs let's talk about the respiratory membrane like we've talked about earlier on. Respiratory membrane is formed by alveolar and capillary membranes that are separated by interstitial space. Okay? Diffusion of oxygen now. Since the respiratory gases are majorly the oxygen and CO2, so those are the guys we'll be talking about. Diffusion of oxygen. Oxygen moves from atmospheric air into the alveoli and from alveoli into the blood down its concentration gradient okay so let's have a look at the partial pressure to to actually buttress the down movements of the gas along its concentration gradient so the partial pressure in the atmospheric air of oxygen is 159 millimeter of mercury then uh to 104 millimeter of mercury in the alveoli so 159 to 104 so that causes you know movement down the gradient so the pressure in the air is higher than pressure in the alveolar that's where i'm going okay then from the alveolar into the blood that is 104 to 40 that is 40 millimeter in the venous blood okay so that allows you know smooth movements down its concentration gradients okay now diffusion of co2 co2 moves from the blood into the alveolar then from the alveoli into the atmosphere, all right, as to the outside, also down its concentration gradient. Now the partial pressure of CO2 is in the blood is 45, then in the alveoli is 40 millimeter of mercury, then in the in the in the atmospheric air is 0.3 millimeter. Of, so you can see that reduction as we go down, so that to to allow you know simple diffusion, you know easy diffusion of CO2 gas, all right. Now let's look at the other section, that is gaseous exchange at the level of the tissues. 
Diffusion of oxygen now. Oxygen moves from the arterial end of capillary into the interstitial space. That is from the blood into the interstitial space, then from there into the tissues. Okay, so let's look at the, the, the partial pressure. 95 in the arterial end of the capillary to 40 millimeter in the interstitial space, then to 23 millimeter inside the cells. Okay, so that allows uh, smooth diffusion. Okay, now let's talk about diffusion of CO2. CO2 moves from cells into the interstitial space. All right, then from there into the blood. So the partial pressure is 46 millimeter of mercury inside the cells to 45 in the interstitial space then to 45 in the blood so it also allows diffusion too all right um so let's talk about the respiratory exchange ratio this is the ratio between the net output of co2 from the tissues to the simultaneous net uptake of oxygen by the tissues all right again the respiratory exchange ratio is the ratio between the net uptake of carbon dioxide from the tissues to the simultaneous net uptake of this of oxygen by the tissues. Okay, so that is the respiratory exchange ratio. Now, respiratory quotient is the molar ratio of CO2 production to oxygen consumption. So, as CO2 is produced by the metabolizing cells it also uh, consume oxygen you know for those metabolic processes so it is used to determine the utilization of different foodstuffs all right because we have variation with respect to those uh, food stuffs now the seventh section is the transport of respiratory gases the transport of respiratory gases the respiratory gases transported are oxygen and CO2 so we start with oxygen transport of oxygen oxygen is transported in two major ways in combination with hemoglobin and in dissolved states that is inside the plasma so when combined with hemoglobin that is about 97 percent of it combined with hemoglobin then remaining three percent you know dissolve in plasma transport of CO2 now CO2 is transported as bicarbonate that is about 63 percent as Carbamino compounds that is with proteins and you know proteins in the blood like hemoglobin like you know plasma proteins and all the lines that's when co2 combine with those proteins they you know they form carbamino compounds okay that one takes like 30 percent all right then finally as in dissolved states that one takes uh seven percent you know that is inside plasma it dissolves inside plasma now but transports as bicarbonates has to do with uh, a concept that we call chloride shift or hamburger phenomenon. Chloride shift, you know, uh, it's 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 a concept that uh, involves the transport of chloride from the plasma into the red blood cell to allow the transport of CO2, you know, in form of bicarbonates inside the plasma. Okay, it's 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 it's, it's an important concept that you know that we be discussing, you know, later. Alright, so now let's talk about the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. Oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve relates the percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen with the partial pressure of oxygen. Okay, that is what uh, the curve is all about. Alright, so we have some factors that affect this oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. We have factors that cause shift to the right and factors that cause shift to the left. Factors that shifting to the right simply indicates the dissociation of oxygen from hemoglobin that is reducing the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen then shifting to the left indicates the association or binding of oxygen with hemoglobin that is increasing the affinity okay now talking about factors that cause shift to the right uh decrease in partial pressure of oxygen increase in partial pressure of co2 that is true balls effect that we're going to talk about later increase in hydrogen ion concentration or decreasing the pH that is increasing acidity, all right. Uh, we call shift to the right, increasing the body temperature. We also call shift to the right, and excess 2 3 uh, BPG, okay, that is bias phosphoglycerate, okay. 
let's talk about factors that uh, cause shift to the left now we have increase in ph that is alkalinity we call shift to the left uh increasing the partial pressure of oxygen decreasing the partial pressure of co2 the nature of hemoglobin chains as in theta hemoglobin that is when the nature of hemoglobin chains uh supports the increased affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen so it causes the uh, the shifting to the left okay so talking about buzz effect buzz effect is when there is abundant presence of co2 it decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen this takes place at level of the tissues at the tissue level why adding effects is the opposite of buzz effect you know in which case abundant presence of oxygen decreases the affinity of hemoglobin for co2 so that one takes place at the level of lungs okay these effects are to actually uh, allow delivery of co2 into the alveoli and the delivery of oxygen into the tissues okay so now the eighth section is the regulation of respiration is very very important regulation of respiration uh respiration is regulated in two major ways we have nervous and chemical control the nervous control uh has to do with the integrating center the afferent and the efferent nerve fibers and the effectors okay the integrating center is the respiratory centers in the reticular formation of the brainstem the afferent nerve fibers are uh, the vagus and the glossopharyngeal nerves the efferent nerve fibers uh, pass through the phrenic and the intercostal nerves okay and the effectors are the respiratory muscles all right the integrating center now proper which are the respiratory centers and the reticular formation of the brainstem now we have two parts the medullary center and the pontine centers the medullary center has two parts likewise the pontine centers uh the the medullary center has the dorsal respiratory group of neurons which are majorly for inspiration we have the ventral respiratory group of neurons which are for both but sometimes uh uh majorly for expiration for the pontine centers we have the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center the pneumotaxic center increases the respiratory rate by decreasing inspiration time that is it sends inhibitory impulses to the dorsal respiratory group of neurons okay then the apneustic center facilitates inspiration by exciting the dorsal group of neurons okay so let's talk about the erebrial reflex. Erebrial reflex is a protective reflex that prevents overstretching of the lungs. Okay. Now let's talk about the components of the reflex. That's the receptor, the afferent nerve, the integrating center, the efferent nerve, and the effector. The receptor is the stretch receptors in the respiratory tracts, majorly in the bronchi and the bronchioles. You know, they get stimulated when the tidal volume exceeded 1,500 mils. Okay. The afferent nerve pass through the vagus nerve the integrating center is in the respiratory center via the tractor solitarius tractor solitarius is a major sensory you know area in the brainstem you know that receive different you know sensory impulses the efferent nerve moves via the phrenic nerve and intercostal nerves so the effector at the respiratory muscles so the response is there's decrease in inspiration and there's increase in expiration that is there's increase in ventilation so to actually blow off excess air in the lungs and the respiratory tracts okay so talking about the chemical control of respiration now this is mediated by receptors chemoreceptors so we have two major chemoreceptors you have central and peripheral chemoreceptors that's based on location central in the cns peripheral in the pns the central sends increase in hydrogen ion concentration that's the major stimulant okay why the peripheral chemoreceptors sense decrease in partial pressure of oxygen increase partial pressure of co2 and increase hydrogen ion concentration okay so that ends that section then the ninth part is the respiratory insufficiencies asphyxia is hyposia plus hypercapnia dyspnea is difficulty in breathing atelectasis is lungs collapse Asthma is a obstructive respiratory disease that causes difficulty in expiration due to bronchoplasm. Okay, emphysema is gaseous distension of the lungs or uh, tissues. 
Pleural effusion is the excessive fluid in the pleural cavity. Uh, we have others are pulmonary edema, pneumonia, bronchial asthma, uh, pulmonary tuberculosis, you know, and how the like is. Then finally, we talk about uh, the effect of exercise on respiration. Now let's talk about exercise. Exercise is a physical activity or series of movements or actions designed to keep a person fit and healthy. Okay. So the severity of exercise determines the gravity of the effect on respiration. So in exercise, now we have this number of you know effects that exercise has on respiration. There is alteration in the lung volumes and capacities, especially the tidal volume and vital capacity. There is increase in both pulmonary and alveolar ventilations. There is increase in respiratory rate. There is increase in force of breathing and also the respiratory rate. Okay, so all these changes are as a result of stimulation of the respiratory centers in the brainstem. Alright, so that actually round off the whole section. I hope you enjoy the presentation. I implore you to get uh, our other presentations uh, on physiology. I hope you will enjoy them. Thank you very much for listening and God bless you. You will succeed.